Oh, Jesus, we come before you today and we acknowledge that you are truly good. Uh, Jesus, you are a good Savior, that you would come to this earth and give yourself for us. You are a good master, that you would rule over us well. You would lead us. And Jesus, you are a good king. Uh, one day you will rule, and we look forward to the goodness of that rule and that reign. Now, Jesus, we turn our thoughts and our attentions to you and what it is that you accomplished for us at your cross. I pray that you would help us to see you clearly through your word, and I pray it in Christ's name. Amen. All right, well, this is the point in our service where we take some time to remember Jesus at his table. It's a time we remember what Jesus did on the cross for those who had placed their trust in him. We're going to be taking some bread and some juice here in a few minutes, and these are symbols of the body and the blood of Christ that was given, that was shed on behalf of all of those who would put their trust in him. It's important that we remember Jesus well during this time, so we're going to be using a passage that proves to us that Jesus has authority, authority as Messiah. So if you have your Bibles with me, would you turn with me to Mark chapter 11? We're going to be looking at verses 27 through 33 together. There are some men coming down the aisles. If you don't actually have a copy of God's word with you, just raise their hand and they'll get you one. If you don't actually own a Bible for yourself, I encourage you to keep this for yourself so that you can read God's word for yourself. The setting here in Mark 11 is that it's the Passover week in Jerusalem. The triumphal entry has already occurred, and the people are following Jesus. Two days earlier from our passage, Jesus entered into the temple. He looked around, and he left. He went and spent the night in Bethany. The day before, he entered into the temple, and he overturned the tables, and he chased out the money changers. He condemned the religious system because the leaders of that religious system had allowed his father's house, which was intended to be a house of prayer, to be turned into a, a den of robbers. And Jesus is here, and he's back in the temple on the third day. And he's walking through the temple, and he's teaching as he goes. And the people are listening to his teaching, and they're following his teaching. His teaching is different from the teaching of everybody else because his teaching has authority. And the chief priests and the scribes, they see this, and they feel threatened. And they want to get rid of Jesus because they see him as a threat. And so we see back in verse 18 that they are seeking for ways to destroy him. So they set out to do this by trapping Jesus with his own words. So as we read our passage, we're going to look at verses 27 through 30 first be looking at the device they use to employ Jesus and to try and trap him in his words. But then notice how Jesus exposes them and their unbelief. Let's read starting in verse 27 together. They came again to Jerusalem and he was walking in the temple and the chief priests and the scribes and the elders came to him and began saying to him, by what authority are you doing these things? Or who gave you the authority to do these things? And Jesus said to them, I will ask you one question and you answer me. And then I will tell you by what authority I do these things. Was the baptism of John from heaven or from men? Answer me. So the chief priests bring up the subject of Jesus' authority in verse 28. They ask him, by what authority are you doing this? What authority do you have to turn over these tables and chase out the money changers? They want him to make the claim that his authority is from the Father in heaven. Because if they can get him to do that, then they have him on blasphemy, and that will pave the way to get rid of him. And that's what they ultimately desire. But the chief priests and the scribes, they already have heard Jesus speak of his authority. Back in chapter 2, when Jesus is uh, healing a man who's a paralytic. Jesus demonstrated that authority by first forgiving the man of his sins before he healed him of his paralysis. And after, even before that, in chapter 1, in his baptism, the Pharisees and the Sadducees were there, 
and they heard the father's voice that says, Behold, you are my beloved son, and in you I am well pleased. So they'd heard his teaching, and they knew that his teaching confirmed his authority. They'd been eyewitnesses to the miracles which attested to his authority. His authority was indisputable. There was not one rational argument against Jesus' authority, but still these men refused to believe it. And Jesus knew their hardened heart. He knew the condition of their heart, and he knew it was hard. And so he doesn't respond to their question with a reply. He responds with another question. He does this in verse 30, and he says, The baptism of John, was that from heaven or was that from man? And when Jesus refers to the baptism of John, he's not referring to the water baptisms that were performed by John, John the Baptist. Instead, he's referring to the overall purpose of the ministry of John the Baptist. We go back to chapter 1 in Mark. Mark is quoting a passage from the Old Testament prophet Malachi. Malachi is speaking, and he's writing, and he's talking about Christ. And these are God's words about Christ. And God says, Behold, I send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. John was the messenger, and John's task was to prepare the way for Christ. Mark then goes on and he quotes Isaiah in the same section in chapter 1. And he describes more of John's role prior to his public ministry. And he says, You are to make the way the ready, make ready the way of the Lord. Make ready the way of the Lord. So when you take these two passages together, the passage that he's quoting from Malachi and the passage that he's quoting from Isaiah, it's very clear that Jesus Christ is the Lord. He is the Son of God. And John was to make his way ready, and he was to do that by calling the people to repentance. And the whole reason why John's ministry was there, because Jesus was the Lord and Jesus was coming, and it was necessary that the, the way be prepared for that man. And Jesus' identity as Lord and Jesus' identity as Master is significant to us this morning as we consider the Lord's table for two reasons. One, because only the Lord, only the Son of God, is capable of satisfying God's wrath against sin. And secondly, only the Son of God is qualified to be head over the church. That's what we want to think about this morning as we consider Christ. If you have put your trust in Christ, if you have placed your trust in Christ, you can know that his work on your behalf at the cross was sufficient to satisfy God's anger against you. If you have placed your trust in Christ, you can know that the reward for that is you will live eternally under Christ's lordship and headship under you, over you, first in this life and then in the resurrection in the life to come. So when the elements come to you, ponder the person of Jesus Christ. Ponder the testimony that John the Baptist's ministry gave of Christ, that he was indeed the Lord, one for whom the way needed to be prepared. And it's on that basis that Christ's work was satisfied, God's wrath against us. And it's on that basis that he will be the head over us in this age and in the age to come. And then so when the elements come to you, ponder and consider Christ as that person. And then when your heart is ready, take the elements on your own. If you're here today and you are not a follower of Christ, I want to draw your attention to the verses that follow our passage. Verses 31 through 33. Notice in verses 31 and 32 that the, the scribes and the chief priests are unwilling to answer Jesus' question. He asks them again, John's baptism, where was it from? Was it from heaven or was it from earth? They know that they could not admit that Jesus was the Son of God because if they did so, they would be guilty for not believing him, believing the testimony of Jesus for who he was. But on the other hand, they could not deny Jesus was the Son of God. The reason for that was because of the people. The people that were right there knew who he was. They knew he was the Son of God. And the scribes and the chief priests were afraid of them. In Luke's account of this, Luke describes that the scribes and the chief priests were fearful that they would be stoned by the people if they rejected Christ. But notice Jesus' sober warning to the unbeliever in verse 33. He's talking to the chief priests and he's talking to the scribes. These are men who continually rejected God's design and Christ's message about himself. They continually rejected the truth of the message that Jesus is the Son of God and he's worthy 
of worship. He's worthy of being obeyed. They rejected his lordship over their life. They rejected him as the Messiah. Look at what Jesus says. He says, nor will I tell you by what authority I do these things. Effectively, Jesus is saying, I have told you everything about yourself. I've told you everything about God, everything about your sin, everything about your situation that you need to know, and you have rejected the gospel message. I am done explaining the gospel message to you. So my appeal to the unbeliever today is, today can be the day of salvation for you. Don't refuse Christ Will you still have the opportunity to in this life. But when the elements come to you, just take them and pass them to the person next to you. This is an occasion for Christians to celebrate the work that God has done on their behalf. So men, come and serve us, and then I'll be back to pray in just a few moments.